Good afternoon. I'm uh, Mike Lignatiev, Rector and President of Central European University, and um, I just want to welcome, there's an extremely distinguished row of ambassadors to my right, so I want to welcome the ambassadors uh, who've come. Um, we are a, uni a global university, an international university, and so your presence confirms what we say to the world, that we reach out to the world, and I'm extremely grateful that you came as representatives of your country, um, and, and thank you. I want to welcome, I see a lot of students here, which is wonderful. I see staff, I see faculty, I see trustees, I thank them for coming. And I want to talk to you uh, about open society and the ordinary virtues. Let me situate this a little bit, and I hope I'm going to then sit on this chair afterwards, and I hope we have a, a good discussion. Those of you who know about this know that this is the second season of a series called Rethinking Open Society. I will not recapitulate 10 previous talks on Rethinking Open Society. I just want to make one simple point about the whole exercise, which is that we are a university with a mission. It's called, we have an open society mission. And that does not make us advocates of a political ideology. It does not make us a political organization. It does not make us an NGO. What it makes us is a university committed to thinking deeply about what free societies need in order to be free and what free men and women need in terms of institutions, in terms of culture, in terms of everything in order to exercise their freedom. So a university's approach to the open society mission is by definition critical. Our, our idea is to turn out young men, men and women, some of whom are in the room, who come out thinking deeply about what it means to be free, who come out thinking deeply about what a democracy is, who come out thinking deeply about the relationship between democracy and the rule of law. And we've been doing this in this series for uh, really since January of this year and we'll continue through the year and I am up first, but we will have some important lectures uh, this autumn and then uh, next semester. And I want as many of you to come back, make this part of your calendar because it's an ongoing inquiry into some of the fundamental questions about what it is to live in a free society. My subject tonight is uh, the following set of kind of questions. I want to talk to you about ordinary virtues, and I'll explain why in a minute. All I mean by ordinary virtues is to contrast them, first of all, with extraordinary ones. Extraordinary virtues are courage, the kind of Courage when you take extraordinary risks, put your life online, make some amazing political sacrifice or personal sacrifice. I'm talking about the virtues that are much more ordinary, much more house and garden. Generosity, forbearance, tolerance, uh, forgiveness. Uh, these are the house and garden virtues, and I want to make a claim that these virtues... Uh, are absolutely crucial to the coherence of a free society. And we don't quite understand how they work together in each of us to produce a moral order and a set of expectations about each other that reproduces a moral order over time. We don't understand how political discourse, public discourse, shapes the ordinary virtues that we display as individuals. I want to make an argument that political discourse can confiscate the ordinary virtues, can make it extremely difficult to express generosity, compassion, and mercy, for example, while, while other discourses can enable and empower those virtues. And then I want to talk about a, an issue that became apparent to me as I did research on this subject, which is 
There's a much bigger conflict than we like to think between the ordinary virtues whose focus and audience is local and universal uh, obligations like human rights. There's a much deeper con conflict between universal moral principle and local virtue. We often think that universal obligations like human rights flow naturally from the ordinary virtues. I want to argue that they're in much more conflict than we like to assume, and that gives us a problem, a political problem, which I hope to discuss. Now, this is also a book talk because it happens, I swear to, swear to you this is a pure accident, that today is the publication date of a book <laughs> called The Ordinary Virtues, Moral Order in a Divided World, um, published by Harvard University Press and available at all good bookstores. That is the end of the self-advertisement. Let me tell you about this project because this book is the result of work that I did over three years sponsored by the Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs, an organization based in New York, one of the philanthropies created by Andrew Carnegie in 1914. I was asked to contribute to a centennial project to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Andrew Carnegie's extraordinary bequest. And I was asked, well, what should the Carnegie Council, a worthy institution that works on the promotion of ethics in international affairs, what should it do to celebrate its centennial? And I said, you should get out of New York. That is, you should get out on the road. That is, you should try and figure out how it is that moral principles are at work in the world, in the messy world out there. Get away from the seminar room. Get away, frankly, from universities. Get into places where people are reasoning, thinking, acting morally, and figure out what principles are at work. And so we set out to do a study of moral order in a series of societies, the United States, Japan, Bosnia, Brazil, South Africa, Myanmar, ended up being the set. And we did two kinds of bits of research. We had structured global dialogues on a series of specific topics, with elites, basically, policy elites, academics, journalists, policy makers. And then we began to realize that this elite discourse was basically a highly globalized discourse. If you sat down in Buenos Aires, and the Argentinian ambassador is here, so I chose the example deliberately. When you talk to people in Buenos Aires, many of them are trained in great international universities. They speak in English to you, you have a global discourse about the language that is used has much less specificity to the Argentinian context than you would suppose. So you, you go to Buenos Aires to have a discussion you could actually have in Budapest or in London or in Paris. It's only when you get out of these global elite milieus that you begin to have a very different order kind of moral discussion. And this was what we call the site visits. You go to a favela. You go to a illegal settlement on the outskirts of South Africa. You go to uh, Southside LA and talk to gang leaders. Then you have a very, very different uh, moral conversation. Let me just, uh, and I'm about to show you some photographs. They are Blurry, not very good, taken by me. But they give you some sense of the kind of places we went. We went to Rio in 2013 to have a discussion about corruption. Corruption and the discourse about corruption. We had discussions with elites who said very simply, corruption is endemic to the Brazilian political system and it's endemic because the public will never revolt against a culture of corruption built into Brazilian politics and society. It's an amusing story to me because the very morning that we heard that discussion, I began to hear the signs of demonstrations in the street. And when we looked out in the window, suddenly there was one 
Brazilian flag, then 100, then 1,000, then 10,000, then 50,000. And suddenly, in June 2013, we were in the, big, in the middle of the biggest anti-corruption demonstration in the history of Brazil. What that tells me is be careful about elite discourse because it may just be wrong. And this is a photograph taken right in the middle of one of these uh, demonstrations. Um, these demonstrations also ended in extraordinary amounts of violence. Uh, these are smashed cash machines right in the middle of uh, downtown Rio um, as anti-capitalist protesters took the corruption uh, protests aside. We also, at the same time, went to favelas, again, getting out of elite discourse and spending time in uh, an extraordinary uh, community called Santa Marta. I wanted to look at moral order in besieged and impoverished communities, and what you see in a place like Santa Marta is given a chance poor communities will form microscopic forms of moral order that start with one neighbor looking after someone else's children, then uh, another neighbor watching over somebody while their kids do their homework, or someone doing shopping for someone else, and you exponentially create moral order out of minute interpersonal interactions. And we saw this in Favela Santa Marta. What is the condition of that? This is a point for liberal democracy. The absolute condition for moral order in poor communities is good policing. If you have predatory policing in Favela Santa Marta, all bets are off. Unless there's a state that you can have some degree of trust all moral bets are off, the moral order disintegrates and collapse. That was one of the things we certainly found there. When we, the same thing became clear when we went to South Central LA. The tough looking guy, and he's absolutely as tough as he looks, is a gang leader in South Central LA who has changed his life, that is, turned away from a life of crime, and now spends his time trying to reproduce moral order among young teenagers in South Central LA. It's impossible to separate these stories of personal redemption from the reproduction of social order. People have, this man has an investment in turning his life around because he knows one of two things will happen. If he doesn't, he will die in prison or die on the street. He doesn't want that life to be reproduced among the next generation. That, enlisting that uh, turns out to be crucial to the reproduction of moral order in South LA. We then went, I know this is slightly breathtaking because we are going around the world, but I wanted to give you the sense of the global reach of the project. We spent a lot of time in Bosnia, in part because this is a community where I have spent a lot of my professional time. Uh, and I was trying to look at the whether uh, tactic strategies of reconciliation are beginning to knit communities together after conflict. How do you create moral order after brutal inter-ethnic war? Um, the one lesson we took out of Bosnia, and it was at this point that I began to see what ordinary virtue was like, was someone saying to me when I asked a young woman of Bosniak origin whether she could ever be reconciled to Serbs, she told a long story about being under siege during the Bosnian War at the age of 16 and discovering that those under siege with her included Serbs. They were being besieged by the Serbs from outside, but among those under siege were Serbs. What she learned from that, she said very memorably was, I've learned not to generalize. The moral center of, more of ordinary virtue as a principle is, I don't generalize. I take people one at a time. This instinct, highly individualistic, highly particularist, I make no generalizations about groups, I take them as they come, is the heart, it seems to me, of the moral wisdom of ordinary virtue, and I learned it from people in Bosnia. <clears throat> 
people who would had to bury the entirety of their village. What you're looking at is the last Bosniak survivor of a village in which every single member of the village was exterminated one day in July 1991. We then continued this discussion by going to South Africa. Again, South Africa was chosen in part because I've spent a lot of academic life thinking about the fate of liberal constitutionalism in South Africa. There's a story where you have one of the best liberal constitutions in the world. Absolutely every international legal studies expert on constitutionalism came to South Africa and wrote a constitution that is the Cadillac, Rolls Royce, Bentley, Audi of constitutions. And it was shepherded through by transcendent political leadership, not just Nelson Mandela's leadership, but the leadership of a whole society coming to feel that liberal constitutionalism was the key to avoiding civil war and inter-ethnic and interracial reconciliation. Flash forward to 2015 and what you're looking at is a lot of South Africa looks like this picture. This is on the outskirts of Pretoria. This is a Zama Zama, a community that essentially doesn't exist in South Africa. That is, it receives no municipal services, no police coverage, no benefits from taxation. It's as if the state doesn't exist for this community. There are about a thousand people living there. And so then the question becomes, in the, in the absence of liberal constitutionalism, in the absence of any state at all, how do these folks reproduce any form of moral order at all? And you begin, we began to see um, that uh, they were entirely dependent on private charity. Uh, they were beginning through private charity to create elementary institutions like a school, like a garden plot. But there, it seems to me, moral order was at its most fragile. And what it brings home to you is the enormous abyssal gulf between the promise of liberal constitutionalism, the guarantees of a liberal order, in a society of, of radical inequality, the distance between what the society promises constitutionally and what it delivers is just beyond fathoming. And anybody who spends time in these communities comes away worrying deeply about the future of open society in places like this because in the search to explain what's happened to liberal constitutionalism and why the promise hasn't been realized, more and more of the black majority reaches for a simple answer, which is we didn't confiscate white wealth when we had a chance. Well, is that a solution or is that a recipe for civil war? That seems to me to be the question posed disturbingly by the visit to South Africa. Let me just conclude by a couple of other slides. Here's a very grim slide of some actuality at the moment because as you know, the conflict between the Myanmar majority and the uh, Rakhine minority has exploded into episodes of frightening ethnic cleansing and violence. One of the people behind it is this monk, a radical extremist monk. One of the issues I wanted to look at is, is the role of religion in reproducing moral order and the role of religion in fragmenting it. This man is a radical uh, Buddhist extremist who is directly responsible for inter-ethnic conflict in uh, Mandalay and was important for someone who believes in moral order that the, the capacities of moral of, of um, ordinary virtue to generate moral order because here's an example of the ways in which in this case religious ideology confiscates the capacity for inter-ethnic accommodation. He sets out an, a religious fog in which any private personal overture to a Muslim is regarded as a betrayal of your religion. This is what I mean by political discourse confiscating virtue. Uh, 
This is the kind of man who closes off the space in which ordinary decency has a chance to speak and be heard. And finally, just to round off this tour, because I want to get to one central point and then take your questions, we ended up going to Fukushima, to Namia, and to all the towns that were devastated by um, the tsunami and the nuclear uh, releases that devastated a whole region of the uh, northeast of Japan. We spent a lot of time there because we wanted to look at how moral order is recreated after catastrophe. And we wanted to look at one of the ordinary virtues that we talk about most but understand least, which is resilience. Resilience is one of the most over-rubbed coins in the moral lexicon, and yet we don't know what resilience means and how it is exercised and how it is operated. And we, we don't understand the relationship between the ordinary virtues of resilience displayed by individuals and what the institutional conditions for it are. And one of the things, one of the, I think, things we discovered in Fukushima, which again is a haunting message for open society, for liberal democracy. Here is Japan one of the most advanced technological societies in the world with one of the most sophisticated national bureaucracies, a political order that is rock solid, in fact, too solid even. And when a, uh, a tsunami followed by a nuclear uh, uh, release occurred, basically central government failed to function. The, nuclear regulator failed to function. The private owner of the nuclear system failed to function. One of the implications of Fukushima for a liberal society is we have no idea how vulnerable our institutions actually are to catastrophe. And we all war, I think open society works on an unstated premise that Somebody must be in charge. Somebody's watching over us. Here was a society where they suddenly realized the central government didn't know. TEPCO, the regulator, didn't. Uh, the uh, the operator of the the uh, nuclear system didn't know. Nobody knew. The only piece that held together was a the Japanese family and municipal authority. Very significantly, one of the reasons why Japan showed resilience was that the municipal officials stood at their post. If you ask how it was that they organized evacuations from Fukushima, it was actually municipal officials doing their jobs in almost impossible conditions. Here was moral virtue and ordinary virtue at its, in a sense, most noble and most very unrewarded. People just did their jobs. That's an ordinary virtue. They did their jobs. They did their jobs in the absence of authorization. They did their jobs in the absence of clarity. They did their jobs in the absence of power. And the fact that they provided some form of institutional grid enabled ordinary families to be resilient. It's this interaction between minimally functioning institutional competence dependent on the ordinary virtue of individual uh, municipal workers and the Japanese family that I think got them through uh, that. But the overwhelming message again of these places is the deep vulnerability of the orders, the liberal orders and the democratic orders that we take for granted. Let me now move to um, my central problem or the issue that I want to end with, which is what do you discover when you um, sorry, what do you discover when you spend three years on the road talking to people about ethics? You discover that there is a conflict, in fact, between ordinary virtue and human rights universalism. And it's a bigger conflict than people seem to realize. We all assume that 
human rights universalism, the idea that all human beings are equal, entitled to equal treatment, is, flows naturally up from the natural moral instincts of, of human beings and is undergirded by the sort of social psychology of moral order that when people are left to themselves, they will create. I think there's a much deeper tension between human rights universalism and ordinary virtue. Um, in human rights universalism, there's no other, there's only us. <laughs> We're all uh, one. In human rights, cosmo in, in the cosmopolitanism that goes with human rights, otherness is constructed, it's artificial. Uh, otherness also is morally irrelevant and can't serve as a justification for exclusion. And duties of common humanity trump moral claims of political community. And so asylum and protection claims, for example, clump the claims of strangers. But if you look at the ordinary virtue perspective, I've been praising the ordinary virtues for the last 25 minutes, now let me take you to where there's a problem. Um, ordinary virtues, the, or, the virtues of ordinary life and ordinary people, but the key point about ordinary virtues is that they privilege the local over the universal, they privilege the citizen over the stranger, us over them, the community over the cosmopolitan. And these are very stable preferences everywhere you go. Um, <clears throat> the, the praiseworthy aspect of the ordinary virtues is at their best, they don't generalize. They offer resistance to the idea that all Muslims are, you know, all Jews are, all blacks are. They are anti-universalist in that good sense, but <clears throat> they particularize individual to individual, and they're very resistant to the idea of some universal moral claim to strangers they do not know. This is the side of uh, the ordinary virtues perspective that can be uh, troubling. Um, in an ordinary virtues perspective, the key moral distinction is self-other, citizen-stranger. And in the ordinary virtue perspective, the stranger is the other. And in an ordinary virtue perspective, race, gender, nationality, all the differentiations of human beings are simply the common garden moral facts upon which you make any judgment. The idea that we have a common humanity that is the starting point for moral reflection is a second order generalization, not uh, a primary element of the ordinary virtue discussions that I witnessed in all of these different uh, settings in the last uh, three years. Um, so here we get to another thing that seems to me to be interesting. If you think about, I defined tolerance, for example, as an ordinary virtue, and, and it is, and the ordinary virtue I'm talking about is you take people one at a time, you don't generalize, you give a kind of conditional welcome to people, um, but in, or, in the ordinary virtue perspective, tolerance is not an obligation, it's a gift. And the contrast between a right and a gift seems to me terribly important. I hadn't realized its salience until I began listening to people. And so tolerance is not unconditional. It doesn't stem from some universal obligation to respect human beings as such. It's conditional on their performance. It's conditional on what, how the stranger recognizes you. And so tolerance is granted only if the stranger recognizes the gift as the gift giver. There's a lot of tolerance out there, but it's conditional on you must recognize me as a citizen who makes a gift of my tolerance, my opening, to you as a stranger. You have to acknowledge that difference. You have to acknowledge my primary in entitlement as a citizen before, before I accord you uh, uh, the gift of uh, uh, toleration. And so this, you can see, leads to a pretty substantial problem. 
uh, it, is it, it seems to me this contrast between the language of the right and the language of the gift is actually at the very center of open society's most difficult problem, which is how we manage the relationship between citizens and strangers, between citizens, refugees, and migrants. Citizens understand that as a gift relationship, discretionary on the citizens' citizenship. International human rights people understand this as a universal obligation based on right. And these two understandings are not the same, and we need to understand how different uh, they are. In this sense, <clears throat> there's a conflict between how international law understands asylum, that is, it's a right based on non refoulement based on the 1951 uh, convention, International law gives states discretion as to the determination of status, but if a claim is well-founded, the obligation is without limit, and we know how this hit Germany. If you build into the Grundgesetz, if you build into German law, um, the obligation to respect the uh, 1951 Refugee Convention, there is actually, in theory, no upper limit to the, the numbers of persons who you might be obliged to admit. And for a citizen, this is simply inconsistent. This is incoherent. It's morally incoherent. It's not merely unpleasant. It's not merely that there are too many people. It's that you have no legitimate criterion to decide who gets in and who doesn't. You're abusing the gift. All of this is uncomfortable terrain. Very uncomfortable terrain for those who believe in, as I do, uh, the open society. The ordinary virtue perspective does not assume asylum is a right or that granting of asylum is an obligation. It's a gift. You give it to those who deserve it. You give it to those who acknowledge you as a citizen. And the ordinary perspective, ordinary virtue perspective does support the idea that countries should close the door when the house is full. None of this is what we in this university want to hear. It's what none of us want to talk about, but it seems to me an issue we need to think about more clearly, possibly more clearly than I am doing. Now, one of the further complications here is the ways in which political discourse on this issue then renders the discussion more and more difficult there are political discourses that empower the language of the gift. Example, I know you're gonna sigh with weary disbelief that I'm doing it yet again, because I am a Canadian, and as you know, Canada is a perfect country, and therefore, my use of the Canadian example is um, um, slightly dubious. But in certain circumstances, the Canadian political discourse encourages the population to think of these issues in the language of the gift. The refugee acceptance policies in Canada urge Canadians to think about families giving the gift of Canadian hospitality to other families in need. What is significant in the public language of Canada is they don't talk the language of rights they talk the language of the gift. And it's the language of the gift that strikes the chord in the Canadian public, significantly enough. Okay? Now, in other political discourses, <clears throat> ones that are not a million miles from where I am speaking, generosity, compassion, mercy, and the language of the gift is sy systematically demonized by public language which says that anybody who chooses to make a gift to a stranger betrays his country, is not a true member of the national community. It sets up an opposition between being a citizen and being a gift giver, which is impossible to cross if the ideology is sufficiently uh, aggressive. And so there's a sense in which public discourse can confiscate, suppress, the very expression, even the very feeling of the ordinary virtues. So that you have countries which have displayed compassion, generosity, 
uh, and mercy towards desperate people. And then when the political ideology gets going, the stuff is silenced in their hearts and in their throats by a language that says, if you talk like that, you're betraying your country. You're betraying your primary allegiance as a citizen. And this is what we're living with. Uh, and, and this way of thinking about it is slightly different from an idea that certain politicians simply express and vocalize what everybody thinks. It's a more complicated analysis, which argues that these political rhetoric confiscate impulses that with other discourse might have a chance to speak and be heard. So, how do we strengthen the ordinary virtues? <clears throat> I think it's one of the things that has to be thought about more clearly is to think through integration between strangers and citizens as a civic contract. Citizens want it understood, and I think they have a right to this, or they should think this, if I say yes to you, you say yes to me. Now what you say yes to is a complicated matter. In, none of us says yes to everything in our own societies, but a minimal yes from those to whom we give the gift is a condition of the gift being given at all. We need political discourses that constantly disaggregate, constantly refuse false aggregation. The idea that there's such a thing as Muslims, that there's such a thing as Christians. And by the way, the confiscation of Christian language here is unbelievable to someone like me who's actually of a Christian origin but not of Christian faith. You'd never know, listening to this language, that Christianity is a language of mercy, compassion, and love. You'd never know it. It's a marker of a negative identity. Whatever a Christian is, they're not Muslim. That form of language is absolute poison to a political system. So we want to find languages, political languages, that empower the ordinary virtues, that allow people to speak, that allow them to express emotions and feelings that are actually uh, present. The only way, I think, to defend the language of rights now is to say it could be you. That is, to emphasize not the abstract language of international law, though I'm as a fond believer in the counter-majoritarian uses of rights talk as anybody. And any decent society must have counter-majoritarian languages reinforced by international law. Don't hear this as an attack on law, rights, or international law. I'm trying to get to the political problem that this stuff is in an extremely perilous political place. It has no political voice. We have to find ways, it seems to me, to empower uh, the ordinary virtues of compassion, generosity, and mercy and hospitality. And we have to defend the idea of rights with an idea, it could be you. The solidarity that works is the solidarity that said, it could be you on that boat. It could be you in that life jacket. It could be you at that frontier border. Um, and, and this language of solidarity has been confiscated. Um, so let me conclude, and I, I, I I, I want to conclude in two minutes and then um, one of the paradoxes that this book ends up with, to return to the book, is that globalization has not brought us together. It's had two completely contradictory impacts. On the one hand, it has reinforced the idea of the moral equality of human beings. How has it done that? because we're living in a post-imperial world. We forget the enormous impact of the end of empire on our moral conscience. In 1945, someone who looked like me and talked like me and sounded like me also thought, although he might be too polite to admit it, that he was born to rule. Both for reasons of gender, both for reasons of race, both for reasons of language. No person looking like me now thinks that, actually.
This is an enormous change in the moral compass of the world since 1945. And it generates a conception of basic equality that I met in Zama Zama, that I met in favelas, that I met everywhere. People looking you in the eye and saying, I count, I matter, you can't treat me like garbage. Of all the good things that have happened since 1945, that's the strongest one. But we, mis we mistake what's happened if we think that that has bred transnational solidarity. It hasn't. People have a strong sense of their equality and moral worth, but the moral focus of their lives remains local, remains the community, remains the nation. Their solidarity is limited. Their solidarity is particular. Their solidarity is bounded. The populist resurgence that we see everywhere is fundamentally anti-universalist. It's picking that up. It's saying, you don't care about human beings beyond your border as much as you care about your own communities. And I am going to speak for you and universalist obligations, European obligations, uh, be damned. The, the, the difficult thought I'm trying to get us to think about is that simply going back to a universalist language of rights, there's no, there is no political space for it. That's the problem. To tell Hungarians, to tell the Czechs, to tell the Poles, you have universal obligations under international law, is not, it's a statement. It's true, but it's not a politics. What is the politics that gets us to uh, an understanding of human solidarity? That's the question I'm trying to raise. And my ordinary virtue perspective shows that the relationship between the universal and the particular is much more antagonistic than I think we assume. So we need to have, I think, an account of the open society that says an open society is actually a community. A community is a bounded space. The citizens in that community have a right to decide who gets in and who doesn't. Okay, that's the tough part. The other part is a, a, a democratic society based on open society principles is also a society of mercy, compassion, justice, and solidarity. And the political task of getting this language right seems to me the most urgent task that open society faces in the years ahead. Thank you for your attention.